somebody in the general scheme of things I built myself the album is the, is the first one that you've done for uh, 10 years and uh, the first thing that struck me when I listened to it first of all, first of all was, was how incredibly fresh the album actually sounds uh, yeah well I had this idea of uh, when, when you uh, actually asked me to do the record the first idea I had was to try and sort of recreate the feeling of my first solo album which is in 1969 and try and do a, a kind of modern take on that sort of and it has that a similar feeling to that album that's what I was going for this kind of uh, it's almost like I'm setting out in a new journey you know which is what I was doing and what I'm Still doing. <laughs> I mean, stylistically, as you say, I mean, there's an awful lot of different styles there on that album. Well, yeah, but it's all kind of my style, you know. <laughs> uh, I make no, I can't really make records any other. There's always a bit of diversity on them, you know. The song I played on is, is it's lovely to play on it also because it's obviously Jack singing, but the, the words are written by Margaret. A Jack sort of trick over the years, I think, in, in his music, where it's got a different, it has different layers and different dimensions to, to the music and to the songs. And, but it's obviously particularly lovely to play on one which is a joint collaboration between Jack and, and Margaret. Yeah, the song just came through me and I wrote it down and I gave it to Jack and then he wrote, he sat on the piano, wrote the music within 10 minutes. So I'm actually quite pleased that I'm not just the executive producer and running around booking people's flights from the States and doing this and that. I'm, I could take part in the artistic side. So. I really uh, brainwashed myself with the track, learning the chords, and even the simple chords, it's actually quite a tricky song because I don't know what came first, whether it was the words and then the music, but the bar lengths and everything, it's not straightforward. And um, that again is very Jack. So when you sat down to write this material for Silver Rails, I mean, did it all come together very quickly or was it something? Uh, yeah, mostly it, it, just everything seemed to happen uh, very, like by chance, but it seemed to be, you know, be, you start thinking, oh, it's, it, it, it's meant to be this way, you know. So all the songs, yeah. And the first one I wrote was uh, Drone, which I actually wrote in the Canary Islands while thinking about how cold it was in England, because it was. <laughs> Was that spring? It would never actually become spring. Remember last year. So that, that those were just were uh, sort of completely formed on one. You know, just, uh, when I wrote those, uh, that was the direction of the album as well, musically. I felt. Well, it's interesting you mentioned drone because drone is the track that really, to me, stood out when I first heard the album because it's uh, it's your voice, bass, guitar, and drums. And yeah. the subject content there, obviously, was 
was it was that inspired by the sort of Af Af the American use of drones in Afghanistan? No, no, yeah, I mean it's it's just all kind of terror bombs and stuff like that. But uh, really, this is a, a again, it's a, a take on politician. It's like another version of that, really. Let New Orleans feel slagging off Maggie Thatcher. What more do you want for? Her? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it does. It does have, you know. It seems it's Second World War as well, though, because it's uh, we overdubbed a Stuka, which was uh, quite difficult, but we managed to do it. <laughs> and it's a, uh, it's an actual uh, raid that was recorded. It's an exceptionally powerful track. Very, very yeah. effective, I think. Yes, I, I wanted to see if I could do something just bass and drums and make it make it sound good. Well, what's the word? He's nicely demanding. He uh, he knows exactly what he wants because the music just pours out of him, doesn't it? And uh, you know, we changed a couple of things over. He said, "Oh well, I like the way you're doing that," so we changed it, and then we changed it back and stuff. So we changed things around a couple of times. But that's the great thing about it—you can. It's never anything really set down in stone. He's a feel guy as well as a technical. We want you to repeat the same as the one before. Did it and did it. And That's lovely, thank you. Beautiful. I think it was it was so nice to hear you play the piano on this album. Yeah, well, that was one of the great things about recording at Abbey Road. Yeah. They've got all these different great pianos all, all perfectly looked after, you know. So I could choose which piano for which track. <laughs> what about that? For luxury and being spoilt. It's fantastic. You know? How did you actually come to, to record at Abbey Road? How, how was that? Uh, well, it was just by chance again, really. Uh, Rob Cass, who's my producer, and quite a brilliant producer, I may say. Um, I just met him at my daughter's film premiere, and because uh, she had worked with him, uh, and I just happened to mention that I was making an album, and he said, "Oh, come and make it at, at Abbey Road," and uh, so I did. <laughs> As you say, he's done a, done a, done a great job. Yeah, he's a, he's a great producer. Was it difficult for you to hand over the reins to someone else in, in terms of production? Because you've done so many albums on your own, you've produced your own things as well. Um, do you find it difficult to sort of let go? Of no, no, I like that. And anyway, I would be going in every day and we'd work together as well on the mixes. You know, if there were um, Things that I didn't like, there was no question of it, they just got changed, it wasn't like, you know, I had to defer to him or anything. It's completely uh, 
soulful guy who just knows what's what's right, you know. As you say, uh, uh, he's. I think he certainly brought out a, a sort of a modern side to your music. And yeah, uh, I think so. Well, well, it's recorded in a very modern fashion, of course. But then people forget we always use the latest cutting edge technology, even when it's eight track or four track. Yes. So. Uh, that's just what we're doing, yeah. It's, it, you, although it was harder to get a Stuka at the time. <laughs> deliberately wrote a song uh, for Robin Trower because I love his playing so much so he's going to come in and do that one that one's called Rusty Lady and it's about the death of Thatcher now she's aging orange and a dirty wind and wait for something to begin Though Jack has, you know, a much wider range of stuff that he's he's delved into and is capable of. I, you know, we do have that rock and roll blues um, background in common. For me today, for instance, uh, you know, I, I brought in uh, guitar ideas that, that I thought might might work, and um, Jack was great with it. So, you know, it's a great way to work that. If people are bringing in ideas, and you know, but I mean, at the same time, they've got to be prepared for. For Jack to say, no, I'm not really mad about that, you know. Daddy went and wait for something to begin. Mentioned the track "Fields of Forever," which to me it's, it's funny you should you mention the parallels with songs songs for a tailor, but again that brought back memories of yeah, it's, you al it's almost tune. like uh, it's reminiscent of that one I did with Cream as well, uh, uh, piano one on the the last Cream album. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, Scrapyard, Scrapyard thing, thing, yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> But it's, it's an incredibly catchy track. I would say even almost a, a touch of the I Feel Free in there somewhere as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my it. attempt. To, uh, no, I think it's quite successful, you know, trying to... Well, that one, again, I just knew we needed a track like that. And I wrote the music for that 10 minutes, that's it. <laughs> and then just uh, Pete came down and we wrote a, l a bunch of lyrics, you know, for anything. Yeah. Is this the first time you've written with? Is this the first time you've written with Pete for some time on, on this? this uh, yeah, it's been been quite a while, you know.
For you, uh, in, in terms of um, the what, where you are now with, with making music at this, this time in your life, does that actually, and, and considering you know, you've had uh, some health issues and, and, and all the rest of it in the past, does that influence your, your how much does that influence your writing um, these days? I don't think it does. <laughs> I think that uh, comes from another place. When you're writing, so you're not you don't re you're not really involving your body or anything like that. This is coming straight from God. <laughs> so the inspiration is, is still there. It seems to be. I didn't know it was still there because I hadn't looked for it for a while. Uh, my head is always full of things like hidden cities and like going around, which is why uh, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> Do you continually write? Do you? Yeah. You yeah, it's not something you, you choose, you, not something you can't do, because I write in my head, so <laughs> unless I have some way of unscrewing it, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so you're always thinking of music, consider, yeah. pretty much? all the time, yeah. And I'm sort of thinking of things and then forgetting them and spending days trying to get them back. Do you actually write, write uh, music yeah, out? Yeah, very often I'll do that. Very often I'll just write, I've got a little notebook, I'll write things down. Uh, if I'm here, I've got a very quick, easy way of, uh, of recording at the piano. Playing together it comes from the fact that Jack was a part of one of my favorite bands in the world, so I've been listening to him so long that he's in my head. You know, he's, he's in there, he's in, he's in here, he's in my heart because I, I I love that music. You know, so um, I I had a, a kinship with him before I ever mm. even had the notion that I might be able to, to play with him. <laughs> you know, it was a dream for me to be able to play with him, but I didn't expect it, you know, but I always had that feeling because I, I love the music, so, yeah. you know, it's, it's all of that. at the creation going back to, to Silver Rails. It's been quite a sort of a family affair for you really. Oh so, yeah, that, that's another it? great thing. That just, uh, they just decided to take over my family, you know, they because they all do things. Kyle has been, uh, film, she's filmed it all. That will be coming out and it's also uh, part of the deal that you can buy. Little making of things, she's been doing that. Natasha's been doing, uh, Every, well, Aruba Red, I have to say, has been doing a lot. And she put together the, uh, the singers on Hidden Cities, that was, uh, she did that. Um, Margaret's been doing everything. Uh, 
my son, my younger younger son doesn't want me to talk about him, so uh, if you don't mind, I won't. Uh, Malcolm, of course, was invaluable uh, because he we did the demos here together. To, uh, for, to, you know, to, we did the demos, and uh, you know it was great working with him. We had a lot of fun. By the time you've done the demos, you think, well, this is it. It's, We've done it now. <laughs> so, did you actually record all the tracks, sort of in their own yeah. right ahead of time? Yes. Yeah. You have to do that nowadays, really. And and how finished were the demos? Were they were they pretty um, close to what actually came out at the end at the end of? The yeah, game? but obviously it's just me and Malcolm playing uh, mostly. There's no, there's you know, there's nobody else playing. But you could easily have used those tracks if you'd wanted to. But. Uh, it was nice to you take it to another level if you go into Abbey Road, obviously, uh, and Abbey Rob, mm. fantastic. You don't